Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. Bob, how's it going? It's going great, Michael. How are you doing? All good, thank you. In Lisbon at the moment, the sun is out, the skies are blue. I'm looking forward to recording a podcast, speaking with host of The Outer Dark and weird fiction author, Scott Nikolai. This is going to be an epic podcast. This is, this, it's not the battle of the podcast. It is, it is a community of podcasts, and, and this is, this is going to be great. Oh, yeah, and a lot of people who listen to the This Is Horror podcast, from what I understand and from what listeners have said to me, also listen to The Outer Dark. So it's going to be fun to do what's almost a crossover episode. Exactly, exactly. It's it, it's probably one of the first. Yeah, well, we, we haven't done a crossover episode, um, I, I think, possibly since... The Hannibal Season 2 review that Dan Howarth and I did with the booked podcast, Rob Olson and Livia Snedden. And again, if my memory is serving me right, I believe that was back in episode 19. So It's been a while. Yeah, I mean, this episode is going to be episode 90 or 91, depending on... <laughs> which one I decided to release it as. So, yeah, it really has been a very long time. Yes, but it's a long time coming, and I think this is going to be great. Oh, yeah. Well, with that said, I believe that you have Scott's bio. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Scott Nicolay. Over half a century back, a child was born amidst the toxic waste dumps and devil-haunted swamps of New Jersey. 26 years later... That child packed all it could fit into a 72 Dodge Challenger and lit out for the high desert of northwest New Mexico and the Navajo Nation, whereas if the dogs bark at night, it is only the skinwalkers. Along the way, he had three children, held jobs including dishwasher, restaurant, hotel cook, factory worker, camera salesman. As a teacher, he and his students co-founded the New Mexico Youth Poetry Slam and the National Youth Poetry Slam. As a caver and archaeologist, he studied and explored the caves and lava tubes of Belize, Easter Island, and the southwestern U.S. Several years ago, he tailed Jack Spicer's Martian to the uncertain boundary between our reality and the cobbly worlds. Now he spends his nights there peering through a grimy window and reports what he sees. Laird Barron called him one of the freshest new voices in weird horror. His books include Anna Kai Tangata. Noctuary and oh, Noct today, excuse me, and the forthcoming The Croaker. What an amazing biography, particularly the first paragraph of that. I think that yes. may be the best bio that we've had. It, you know, if you're gonna have if you're gonna have a long bio, then then it needs to be just badass, and that's exactly what that was. That's probably one that I, I, I wish my bow was that good. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you and me both. And now for a horror interview. So, Scott, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. It's nice to be on someone else's podcast and not have to worry about (laughs) editing it later. Oh, yeah, well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And as I was saying to Bob, I think this is the first collaboration with someone from another podcast that we've done since around episode 19 we've booked and this is going to be episode 91 so it's been a while interplanetary podcasting exactly <laughs> <laughs> definitely detente detente is what we can why don't to begin with if we could talk about your first experiences with story, whether that was writing, reading, or simply telling stories. I would say some kind of stories and an interest in stories and storytelling has been part of my whole life. I think a lot of it crystallized when I was about seven years old, six or seven years old, and I was growing up in New Jersey. 
and that was when I was in the second grade. It was uh, 1969, 1970, I think. And at that time, I had heard there was a, in, in New York City, which was about an hour from, hour's travel from where I grew up, there was a famous uh, DJ or broadcaster named Gene Shepard. You might be familiar with him. He's best known today because the guy who wrote and narrated the movie The Christmas Story, you know, with the lamp and the BB gun and all that stuff. Right. And he's also, if you've read Jack Kerouac's On the Road, at the very end of On the Road, Jack Kerouac talks about this crazy all-night DJ, and that was Gene Shepard. He was part of the, the beat generation and all that stuff, too. And he had this radio show late at night on WOR out of New York, and he would go all night and just talk, you know, all kinds of random, crazy stream of consciousness stuff. And by my time, by, say, 1970, he had a regular show. I think it came on at like a 1030 at night, and he did just an hour. And he would just get on and tell, make up these crazy stories. And I was familiar with some because he had the, this traditional Fourth uh, of July story, Independence Day story. He told called Ludlow Kissel and the, and the, uh, the Dago bomb. Dago bomb is a rude expletive for Italians, but uh, he explains in the story the way he said. I mean, we don't use it anymore, but especially in my neighborhood. <laughs> but it's a good way to get your ass kicked in my neighborhood growing up. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, it was kind of an obsolete, you know, expletive at that time. Um, but anyway, it's, it's about this fellow that uh, the town of Nebriot who, who detonates like kind of a giant, you know, Roman candle in the middle of the street and ends up blowing up half the neighborhood. And it, and they would always play that on the radio on uh, the Fourth of July, and we'd listen to it, you know, coming back from the fireworks shows and stuff like that. So I I remember that one from like very very early on, and it's a riveting story. And he would do all these sound effects. And I remember maybe from the time I was three. So. That Christmas, I got a transistor radio for my birthday. Uh, for, for Christmas. <laughs> my birthday's not Christmas. So for, for Christmas, I got a transistor radio for my parents. And I had a little, little earphone, like a one like single earphone that you would sort of jam into your ear, you know, into the wax and sort of try to stuff it in there as painfully as you could. And I would listen to him late at night when I was supposed to be going to sleep and listen to his show. And he would tell these incredible stories, some of them. I was just riveted with those stories. I, mean, I remember them to this day. And I think that was a real a pivotal influence on me at that time. And I discovered around the same time the Hardy Boys and very shortly after H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. And I think, so I think a lot of things crystallized for me then. I was always obsessed with you know, stories and, and monsters. And, and the other thing I think that was a real early input was every year on Halloween, I have to ask my brother if he remembers this, after the trick-or-treating that we would do here in the States and, you know, we'd get home and it would be dark and my dad would take the jack-o'-lantern and he'd put it on the, on the stereo, the cabinet of the stereo in the living room and he'd light it and turn off all the lights. I guess my mom would just go to bed. She didn't remember her having anything to do with the stuff. It's crazy stuff. And my, my brother and I, my brother was two years younger, so maybe it was just me at the beginning, and he'd sit down in the dark with us in the living room and he would t- I don't know where he was making up these stories. I've never run into another one again. But he read a lot of, uh, my father was a voracious reader, read a lot of science fiction especially. And he was always had a stack of like nine or ten books from the local library, you know, with, that was mostly science fiction, but just anything that was coming in. And, you know, so I picked up on that stuff. Really. And he would tell these really, some of them were really good, you know, my memory. And I wish I could remember more of them. I wish somehow we'd recorded it or something. So just, this is just early influences that came together for me, if that's the sort of thing you're looking for. So you can see that, you know, horror and really weird stuff is, is and, and also kind of a satirical edge is, is in there from the very beginning. Well, you mentioned your brother. So does your brother now write stories as well, or did he follow a similar path? No, he, he and I are, I love my brother to death, but he and I are, are quite different. He he was into athletics a lot more, and he became a salesman. He's doing quite well. He, he's more financially successful than me. He's a great guy, but he, he I'll tell you one thing about my brother. He, he bought uh, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother passed away in 2001, and she had this big old house. It was just about a mile from where my, I grew up, and a lot of the family lived in the, in the same town at that time. We're very close by. And my brother bought that house and renovated But that house is the setting of my story, Do You Like to Look at Monsters, which won the World Fantasy Award. So my yeah. brother, so I told my brother, the story that won, the story is, is in your house, bro. <laughs> 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 I killed Uncle Quentin in your house. <laughs> it's very <laughs> refreshing to, to actually talk to someone who's, who's read The Hardy Boys. Oh, God. 
I'll, t- I'll tell you, there's an interesting thing, and, and you know, these things, those little trivia things that tie together in my, in my own stories that no one else would care about. But that, that second grade year, again, I remember there was a kid named Sid Stoddard who later became kind of an asshole. And, and he had these older brothers that were like mean bullies and stuff. But uh, he lived on a sort of a bit, a bit north of where I lived. It was like when I was a little kid, at that point in second grade, it was like farther than I was allowed to go by myself. So I think my parents had to drive me over. But there were in that that in my class that year, there were several kids from that neighborhood that I had met before, and we became friends for a while. And I would go hang out over there, and my parents would come pick me up when it got dark, whatever. So I remember going over to Sid's house one time, and he had all these older brothers, which is a real advantage. I didn't have that when I was a kid. I had an older cousin, and I picked up a lot of stuff. Well, I'd set a lot of older cousins. I picked up some stuff from them, especially my cousin Stephanie. But this guy Sid had all like I don't know like eighty seven older brothers. You know, it's a big mob, <laughs> and 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 they all had you know it was back in those days like every they didn't have their own room. So there's like four kids, you know, four guys sharing a room with you know bunk beds, right? right. So I go into I go into his room. It's like an army barracks or something, you know. I mean, there's like two bunk beds in one room. These old wooden bunk beds, and so we're sitting in this bed, and like on the on the railings of the bunk bed, they had his brothers had all their their stuff. And I remember, and they had like Hardy Boys books, like stacked up there. I guess they were one of them was like a Hardy Boys reader. And I remember specifically this one called the Crisscross Shadow. And I saw this look, this incredibly ominous, you know, of course, fascinating thing. This cover, and I'm like, wow, what is this stuff? And the Hardy Boys. And I remember also very specifically, one of them had a you know a plastic model that they assembled and painted of the Hulk. And he had where, and he was running, and where his feet would step, there would be these little plastic sort of Marks, you know, like the 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 the, the percussion, you know, the pow mark, you know, this little yellow, like where his feet are kind of exploding against the ground in the comic. These were like little right. jagged pieces of plastic that were painted yellow underneath his feet. It was really weird, and I and I and I and I, and I, I was unfamiliar with a lot of these Marvel comics characters still at that stage. This is 1969 and 1970. And I said, Sid, who? What's that, man? What's what's that? And he goes, That's the Huck. <laughs> Huck. It was a long time before I realized it. That's like three more years before I realized it was the Hulk. But uh, I remember that's where I picked up on the Hardy Boys from that guy. And I just recently used that guy in, in a brand new story. I made him a char- minor character, that guy Sid's daughter. That's why I mentioned this odd connection. Or a character based on him. I shouldn't say that because that's going to be right. Depends. All characters Depends. are Depends. Yeah. <laughs> Any similarity. All, it's any, all any fiction, yeah. Person, any, any similarity to any actual person is, is purely similarity. Oh, it's this, the standard disclaimer. Insert standard, standard. disclaimer. Yeah, a lot of my characters are drawn from real life to some extent. Well, there's your memories are a wealth of information that you can use. That's, yeah. I, I'm finding that out. And instead of instead of making up a character, I can just change someone's name. <laughs> it makes yeah, it I always, a change, I'd always change a few aspects of it. Like you know that the story I wrote that's set on Easter Island. You know, several of the people play roles that were a part of actual expeditions I was on. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, like, the archaeologist does pretty much my role, but, and, he, and he's got some of my experiences, but he's, his personality is not mine, I hope, because he's kind of a loser, and, and a sto- I'm not a stoner, you know. Yeah. Not, to, not to put down people who's marijuana, but uh, he mm-hmm. was, I mean, he's got issues, that guy. And, and the expedition lead, there was a guy who actually had that role in our expedition, but he wasn't a you know big asshole like the character in, in that story either. So you know, I, I tend to make everyone a little bit more of an asshole. I love the Coen brothers. You know, the Coen brothers sometimes make movies with where everybody's an asshole, like Burn After Reading, right? I, I always kind of like that. So just make everybody an asshole. <laughs> kind of like real life, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what about the first story you ever wrote? Was that something you wrote? after these experiences with the Hardy Boys and the Halloween stories and Lovecraft? Well, interestingly, I think I didn't really take to writing. I mean, I, maybe I had always had some sense it was, I could always write well as a kid, and I could extemporize, you know, orally very well, too. Most of, most of the time, I mean, I had my duds, right? Everybody does, but, mm. and I wrote some, I wrote some stories, you know, from maybe the fifth grade on, but I, I wasn't one of those kids who was always compelled. It's really strange, because I, I read so many writers, you know, talk uh, interviews or autobiographies or biographies, and they, they talk about, you know, they they were writing from the earliest age and they're writing, you know, like novels when they were in junior high and stuff like that. I remember trying to write this science fiction novel 
maybe when I was in like eighth grade or something like that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't know, it's probably 10 pages of it lying around somewhere, but it was just absolute garbage. And I was obsessed with Edgar Rice Burroughs then. I was basically obsessed with plots that would get me out of my hometown into an alien planet with women with large breasts. You know, that was the whole... <laughs> that, was, that was all... And, 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 of course, lots of weird monsters and things, right? So that's mainly what I was interested in. And I, I didn't have any sense of narrative or plot, and that, and that came later. So I don't think I really wrote anything serious. And, and then when I went in... Co by the time I was in college... I was, I was, I think I was always more interested in absorbing stories for a long time. Right? And you get to a certain point, what happened to me is I got to a certain point where I couldn't find enough of what I wanted anymore, and I felt compelled to create it myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, in, in, well, in college, which is in the, in the 80s, mid-80s, that's when I really decided that I, I wanted to write, and I wanted to write seriously. Around that time, I think that the writers who were most in my mind, you know, when I say influ influence is kind of a confusing term to people who don't really, uh, if they're not writers themselves and don't understand, it's more like, you know, sort of a party where you're just talking, you're hanging out with these writers, you know, even if they're dead, you know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. John Langan wrote a, a good, really good piece about that recently. It's not, it's not this, you know, anxiety of influence like that asshole Harold Bloom wrote. It's, it's more that, you know, it's, it's you're, you're, everybody's sharing, even if they're dead dead are still sharing with the living and, and in some way you know the, the writing of people that are still working is is re is, is breathing new life back into works of people who are dead it, it reinforms them and gives them new meaning and creates new connections so anyway um, the writers reply most of my mind at that time would have been Joyce and Faulkner and Gertrude Stein uh, Willa Cather uh, Calvino Richard Brautigan Kerouac Hunter Thompson Hunter Thompson and Kerouac from a very early age. And those things were the right, you know, those are the, especially the writers I think that was most in my mind and informing what I was trying to do then. And I was also reading a lot of poetry, William Carlos Williams and Allen Ginsberg and Charles Olson and, and the Beats uh, were a huge influence at that time. So my writing, my approach to writing was very avant-garde. I wrote some stories in college. One was published. I think I, think I had a scan of all the, the stories, or all the pages uh, in a folder on my Facebook page. And, you know, the story looks more like a poem. It's, like, written in broken lines. Even, like, some of the lines are just numbers. <laughs> it's very avant-garde, you know. But, uh, so, so I, I did write some, and I wrote a couple others that didn't get published. And I had this plan of all these stories I was going to write. They're all, all the stories were based on, like, major works of modern art. <laughs> like, really avant-garde modern art, you know, from, like, you know, surrealism and futurism and cubism and data and that, that, all that stuff. And ex abstract expressionism. And, and I, was, I, was, I was absolutely in love with Marcel Duchamp back then, too. I was obsessed with Marcel Duchamp. And I, I did a couple of those stories. The first one got published. The second one didn't, you know, in, like in a college literary magazine. It got published. And I kind of faded out with that and faded into poetry and focused more on poetry for a long time. And that was really my emphasis. And then in the 90s, I, I really dug deep into noir, which is a lo other long-time love of mine. I mean, I really feel that weird and noir are two sides of the same coin, which is something I've talked about before and written about. And I was deeply immersed in, in reading noir. And, and the writer that I thought, the writer that really crystallized a lot for me then in the 90s, as much as I love Dashiell Hammett and Jim Thompson and, and a lot of these other writers, and those are two real favorites. And Hammett was a huge influence very, from very early age, too. But Charles Williford really blew my mind. I thought Charles Williford was the greatest thing ever, and I still think he's really damn good. And after I'd read, that's like, the guy every, who did the uh, he did the Hope Mosley. Yeah, Miami Blues. Oh, he's yeah. best known for that. I think my favorite is the Shark Infested Custard. But yeah, everything the guy wrote was gold, pretty much. If it wasn't good, some of it was tarnished gold. Maybe some of it was fool's gold. It was all gold. Yeah, I saw the movie. Miami Blues, and then I read the book, and I was like, "Oh man, this movie sucks compared to this book." The book was yeah, it's, just it's, 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 it's so good, good movie. but the the movie is a lot edgier, you know. And and if you read the book, that that in that one particular, and it's it's a running theme throughout his work. He seems to be obsessed with 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 butts, you know, butt activities, <laughs> mm -hmm. with, with all kinds. I of, still uh, thought of I there. still use lines from the movie. And, you know, I, and I, I probably haven't seen the movie in, golly, almost 20 years, you know. But if somebody <laughs> presents me with something that I really, really want at a, and, and it's affordable, it's a no-brainer, I, I look at them and go, rep it up. 
<laughs> you know, just like when he's talking about uh, with Baldwin's talking about the boat. At the it's got to be Baldwin's best ball, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Other than Thirty Rock. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's great stuff. So anyway, you know, I, I read everything I could get by him, and I ran out. And I mean, there were other books, but they were out of print. I couldn't afford. You know, I, the internet was coming around by then. And you, could, you could track down some of these things and get them, but I just decided to start writing. And I wrote. I wrote. Several stories in kind of a noir vein. Uh, there was one called uh, Big Dish Little Dog, I wrote. That was the first one. This is mid-90s. You know, this is about 20 years ago. And another one called It Ain't Easy Being Green. And you know, these, these were stories. I, I, I labored over these stories. And I, the, when I finished the first one, I thought, God, this is, you know, this is great. And I, and I think they have their moments. I, I've lost these stories. Um, I sent a lot of them out. None of them ever got published. There was one that was a mashup of Jim Thompson and H.P. Lovecraft. And that's actually the only one that survives, and no one will ever see it. I've showed it to maybe a couple <laughs> people, but it's like they, no one's allowed to, to have it, you know, a copy of it. Because I don't... <laughs> and anyway, it's the mashup of H.P. Lovecraft and Jim Thompson, and it was called uh, The Cthulhu Inside Me, which is just awful, you know. <laughs> and I think it... I mean, I go back. I mean, it has moments. It definitely has moments, I think, of, of the sort of stuff I've gotten that I think in my writing are good and strong, and I like to do. Uh, but it's not something I would... I would publish now. It's about a librarian who becomes obsessed with this. He's a he's a voyeur, and he he um, he has, he becomes obsessed with this one particular girl. But his his thing is that he, when girls are using the computers on the internet table, he goes in in the, in the shelves and peeks you know through up their skirts from behind the, the next shelf, you know, and he sees this girl like there's something moving around inside her skirt, you know. <laughs> he becomes obsessed with her and. And uh, you know she's got some some Lovecrafting action going on up there. No, they rewrite that story. No, nah, it's 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 garbage. I would never. It's like the horse pulpy crap. I, and it's I want so, to, want to there's, read. I it. mean, there's a scene at the end. <laughs> yeah, the girl's a dominatrix, and there's a scene at the end where she like beats beats the sub to death with a with with a with an anti theft device from a car. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a piece of crap. <laughs> I think the end of the story has the two of them like going off, like you know, like, like on a crime spree, like what, what's you know, like natural born killers, to, and and going to um, to to meet you know a guy who's implied to be Bill Gates, and that Bill Gates is like Nara Hotep or something. It's just the worst garbage. But all those stories, and I wrote a couple others. You know, there was a a swords and sorcery story, which is actually if I ever salvaged any of them, it would be that one because it's a very Clark Ashton Smith influenced thing, and I think that could that one actually might be fun. To, Posh up if I ever started wanted to do some of that stuff for sort of fun, but none of those ever published. I sent them out, and a lot of times back then, you know, 20 years ago, people never even responded, they never even returned your manuscript, even if you sent like a stamped self addressed envelope. So some of these things just disappeared. And then I, the hard drive that I used at that time is from my old work computer, and I had used some kind of compression software, and then I think it's compressed again. And I've never been able to find like the exact combination of like two different compression softwares to decompress it. <laughs> so I have these files still, but I, nobody can open them. See, the youth of today will never understand the struggle, yeah, the they, real struggle <laughs> of the, of the pre-internet uh, subbing. You know, yeah. uh, a joke about that. We used to walk uphill to to the post office, you know, in the snow. <laughs> And wait years, years. Oh, this, no, no, no shit, Bob. I'll tell you what. There were two. You know, I got like the, uh, you know, the the mystery writers market or something. You know, there, there's the book, the poets market that is poets everybody has. You know, well, it's online. Mm -hmm. All this stuff's online now, right? But I have I have like five or six of these old books that are thick and huge. And I, I don't think I, I for what I ever you know subbed out of those books wasn't worth it much. But the, the mystery writers one, I think, or there was fiction writers, whatever it was, short story. I, I found there was a magazine called Hard Boiled, you know, one called Noir, and I thought these are perfect for this sort of thing. I mean, of course, the stuff I was doing wasn't. I was doing stuff about like losers that got into situations over their heads, and and shit went south real fast, you know. And those, those, but those are the best stories. They probably that's what maybe I like, maybe yeah. not then, maybe not then in general, but I mean, those are the stories that I love. I mean, you you kind of hit the nail right on the head when you said that Noir and and weird fiction. And I think it's because you you're typically dealing with the protagonist, though who may be an actual asshole, is actually a lot more sensitive than you would find in your square jawed hero protagonist. Especially sensitive to surroundings and memories and things like that, which can kind of lean to the weird fiction. 
Right, and especially likely to get into bad situations that are going to be close to the edge. And what does Hunter Thompson say about the edge? The only people who know where it is are the ones who've gone over. Exactly. So yeah, and I think I think that's very true about, about weird and noir. But um, so yeah, I wrote a bunch of these stories. And I'm, anyway, I, like I say, I sub to these, these magazines, hard boiled noir stuff like that. You know, magazines that I thought oh, this is like the perfect market for me. You know, I just love to be in a magazine with that name. And and they never returned. And to this day, to this very day, like twenty years later. Every time I go to pick up my mail at the post office box, I don't have home mail delivery. I have to go to the post office in town. I have to drive like 40 miles, right? Mm -hmm. And every day that I go in there, I park my truck and I go into the post office and I still do these like super, you know, like stuff, the superstitious stuff that baseball players do. I'm a very superstitious guy. I can't help. <laughs> so I, I have to make sure that I, I, as I go into the post office box, my, I can't wear my, as I enter the door of the post office, I have to take off my sunglasses first and I, and I have to put my keys in the pocket. And I can't take out my post office box key till it's really close to the to the like the the, the lock, so that the right. store so like the important mail won't know I'm about to open it. I got to surprise it. <laughs> right. I literally do this, and I'm still waiting. I'm still expecting to hear back from those two damn magazines that never responded. <laughs> I mean, in some part of my mind, I cannot approach that post office twenty years later without, you know, thinking that Matt, these things are finally going to show up. That's that's you never know. Is. That's pathetic. Uh, don't say that, Bob. Yeah, because that's my problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking maybe they will. I mean, maybe uh, it finally comes back. I mean, shoot, dude. I waited three years for Borderland 6, you know. And, of course, you know, even in the Internet age, three years is a long time now. I yeah. mean, shit, I thought the story, I thought they lost it. I was subbing it elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, that one did <laughs> you know? take a long time. And I guess there's still some hang-ups with it. That's from yeah. what I from other contributors. Not, I'm, gonna, I'm not bashing anything there. Well, you know, here's an, here's an interesting thing. My son, Jesse, who co-wrote uh, the story in the Laird Barron Tribune Anthology with me, he's 22 now. And when he was five, and he was living with his mom in Santa Fe, he asked for a particular, uh, like, Nintendo game, right? Mm -hmm. And I ordered that for him, and I put it in a box, and I, I shipped it down to him in Santa Fe. And his mom said someone stole it, you know, out of the post office box, and we never got it. No. Uh, because it was trying to get something nice for my son that he really wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. And last winter, that thing was returned to me in the mail. Wow. 16 years later, the box came That's out. a long time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I forget now, but it seems to me something else bounced back to me late. And I think it was from that same post office, Santa Fe. I think what happened was, like, some guy in the dead letter office in Santa Fe was just piling shit up, and he retired, and he went in there and found all that stuff. That's exactly what I was thinking too. And immediately I thought of the Great and Secret Bartleby. Show. Yeah, they're called yeah. the Great and Secret Show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought of that immediately and I was like, oh my God, it's really happening. <laughs> the, the first part of that book is, is so great and then it just goes off the rails. But yeah, that, yeah. I, my, your knowledge may vary. I, I agree with you because I know some people, they swear by it. I'm like, nah, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not nothing gonna, I'm not nothing beats the books of blood. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was his, you know, when Stephen King said, I've seen the future of horror, uh, it was Clive Barker. He was kind of saying, yeah, I've seen the future of horror, but not necessarily the future of Clive Barker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where were we? I always, I, I tend to go on a lot of tangents, so I probably derailed your, the train of the interview. <laughs> I'm just, I'm still waiting, you know, for, I'll, I'll let you guys know if those things ever come back. Yeah, yeah, please do. I mean, <laughs> 16 years later for a Nintendo game to be returned is... That's insane, isn't it? It, it is. <laughs> yeah, that, that is that is crazy. My son didn't even remember it. You know, I said, hey, do that, that, you remember that time I bought you that? Because I wanted to know, like, hey, Jesse, I really did buy that game for you. <laughs> See, here's proof I did. Yeah. <laughs> 16 years did. later. Yeah, it's... it's doesn't remember you remember anymore which i guess is good i guess he's not holding a grudge about it that's good well, i suppose i might as well ask what was the game i, I can't even remember now though it's in my closet um I, i've got it. i don't know what to do with it you know <laughs> <laughs> i should take a picture of it you know post it on facebook and say does anybody ever you know want, want to play these old games and want it you know maybe someone can use it i hate to throw it out maybe it could be a giveaway on the outer dark <laughs> There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Email in if you want it. <laughs> I'll take I'll take a picture of it when I get home. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I'll send it to you guys. And okay. Can, can See if we can include it in the show notes of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you do the uh, the post on the website, put the picture on there, and that'd yeah. be really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If anybody wants that video game, message me. You know, tell me why you want. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if they've got kids, I'll send it. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I can't get the idea of the Cthulhu inside me out of my head after you've mentioned <laughs> it's the that. Worst, it's the worst title ever. <laughs> but you should write it. It sounds so pretty. I love it. I'll write it. I'll send it to S.T. Joshi for Black Wings 67 or something. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Actually, it'd be more appropriate when he finally does Red Wings. So. Yeah. But that's another story if you, if you get the Hunter Thompson reference there. <laughs> oh god <laughs> that's i think bob just got that one right <laughs> or maybe brown wings i don't know either one would fit better than uh, uh, that's that particular story especially i mean did did you ever get any feedback for the cthulhu inside me because I, I i just feel that even from what you've said about it you you couldn't be indifferent to it. You're either gonna uh, re yeah, I, really the dig it. Feedback I remember is it's the very last thing of mine that my ex wife ever read, and after she finished it, she kind of had this horrified look on her face. And she said, "Scott Nicolay," and that was the whole feedback she gave me. <laughs> and she never ever would read anything read anything I wrote ever again. Well, I'm just imagining with the success that. Uh, Joshua Chaplinsky of Lit Reactor is found with <laughs> Kanye West reanimated. This is the kind of thing that it, if you did release it, it might just go viral. Uh, no, nah, it's not that. Good. It's not that good. Maybe I'll change the main character to Donald Trump or something. Then it will. I don't know. Tetris. The Donald Trump inside me. <laughs> oh no, that's, that's worse. Jesus. That's worse. Let's let's change. Let's move on. From Fucking there. hell. Let's <laughs> move <laughs> on from there. Ah, uh, see, why did you even say that, Michael? Now yeah. I'm suddenly gotten scared. Can't, I'm looking over can't my shoulder. See a mental image. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ugh. Oh God. I have to think of violent crime scenes for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at BG <BG> pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we got you on the show, we were reading your bio, and we said it had to be one of the most exciting bios <laughs> we, we've had. That's because I clean out all the dull parts, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think Laird Barron is was way ahead of me. You know, I've never run the Iditarod naked three times or whatever he did. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna kill me now. <laughs> I, mean, I just remember him talking about doing it with his shirt off for a while one time. You know, but uh, who knows what? You know, men do strange things beneath the northern lights. Was that what Robert Service says? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll continue with my question <laughs> after we've got... Yeah, I can derail most Derailed again. <laughs> but you've held down an awful lot of jobs, so dishwasher, restaurant and hotel cook, sheep herder, which was perhaps the most intriguing. Yeah, I didn't get paid for that. Actually, I have a story coming out soon based on that experience. Uh, it's yeah. going to be in that anthology... That uh, what, Kurt Favre and Joe Netti are editing. It's called Monsters Rebuilt, I think, um, from April Moon Books. Mm. I, I believe I'm correct there. And actually, they're working on they're they're releasing illustrations for a couple of the stories, uh, advanced stuff, and I think for the Kickstarter. And J first one it is from Jeffrey Thomas, and then they're doing one for mine too. It's a Chupacabra story. They wrote to me and said, do you want to do a monster story? And I said, can I do it? I think they even mentioned like cryptids or something. They want to do the you know, traditional or classic familiar monsters, I guess. And I said, mm -hmm. can I do Chupacabra? And they said, yes, OK. I got it. And I, I, re I basically used the journals I actually kept while I was herding sheep on this mountain in Navajo Nation in 1991. And I, I rewrote my actual journals and just, you know, added this whole, changed the characters some and added this narrative, you know, threaded this narrative through it and added the monster, of course. That sounds very interesting. They loved it. They seemed to, I mean, they liked it so much they picked it as one of these two stories they want to do, you know, illustrations to, to promote the book. So I was very excited about that. I just got to see that just a couple of days ago, the, the editor and the artist sent me um, the first, uh, they sent me some four, four concept, you know, sketches and the very first one I wrote back said, this is exactly, almost like 99% exactly what I saw in my mind when I wrote that scene. So it was kind of exciting when you know, an artist is getting in your head that much. So this is coming out this year from April Moon Books? Yeah, I forget the exact date. But yeah. So it was this adapted from your release, Poems from a Sheep Herder's Journal? 
Yeah, it actually, it's this, well, both books, the story and that book are adapted from the same journal. Mm. That makes sense. So there's a little bit of overlap content, yeah. So that, that was released back in 1992. Was that your first publication? Uh, first standalone publication that was self-published. I was, I, I started doing, through my job, uh, working with students and teaching. I started doing school newspapers and, and I had done, actually, I'd worked on a magazine in college too. So I did, uh, I did a lot of uh, design. I learned to do page maker when it was still like version page, you know, page maker one, two, you know, and I, I was really wanted. To, I just really wanted to do this whole book. Like it was, I wanted to do the whole book. You know, it was the sort of thing I did on my own. And I didn't. I, just, I never sent it out to anybody to try to get it published or anything. I just wanted to. I wanted to control the whole thing and, and make it. So I made this little little chat book and I got it printed locally. And I made it, a bunch of books from that press and I published a bunch of other people's stuff for a while. I haven't done anything for a long, long time with it. But yeah, I published a lot of poetry books. Some of them are really nice. So you were self-publishing over a decade before it even became a popular thing to yeah, do. Yeah, I, mean, that was, uh, I guess, was that 1992, I guess I did that? Three, two, three. So, yeah. I did, I did two books of my own. Just put, The second one was an even small release. It was, uh, it, it was um, like sort of, what do you call, haibun, like uh, Matsuo Basho's uh, Oku no Hosomichi, where mm. it's a mix of haiku and, and a short prose narrative. And it was a little, little tiny chapbook I did. I only did like 75. And, you know, I mostly gave them out to girls I was flirting with. So <laughs> mostly probably got thrown in the trash. If it, I've never seen a copy of that one ever come up for sale <laughs> on like eBay. The, the, the Look at You Get Mountain journal po- book will come up every now and then on eBay or Amazon. You know, mm-hmm. like a used copy. Or every now and then I'll run across a used copy in a bookstore in New Mexico and, you know, see who I signed it to it and gave it away. <laughs> or died. <laughs> Um, Call him. I found your book. I'm sending yeah, it yeah. back to you. Yeah. It's, you know, it's never been anybody I really, it. it's never been ever, anybody I really cared about. I mean, one time I found one that was uh, I signed to this guy Victor De Suvero, who was this some rich guy who came out to New Mexico about 20 years ago, and you know he was like some he was rich enough to publish. He was self publishing too, and he he was you know fancied himself a poet. He was an awful poet, but he I think he's still around. Fuck you, fuck you, Victor. Because <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's just some some rich guy who makes you know can do whatever he wants. I mean, he can publish it crap, and he published other people. And I remember the books used to do look like crap. But he came to some reading, and he was like, "Oh, you know, I'm Victor." So I gave him a copy of my book. So that one that one popped up in the used bookstore. I think it's worth it. It's probably worth a lot more if this monsters rebuilt you know thing takes off. And I and I checked online. Yeah, that is that's the right. It's April Moon Books, and it's Monsters Rebuilt. And, and, and I, I hope those guys don't think I'm not, like, serious into the project. It's been ongoing for a while. In fact, I wrote the story almost right away, and it's over a year ago, I think. And so it's, I guess some of the people are still finishing their stories. So I've got to yeah. things on it. You know, I forget. Stuff, stuff gets in the middle desktop, and I'm, like, forgetting. I want to make sure I had the exact title. But yeah, that's what it is. Some uh, of those anthologies just take a long time. Yeah, they do. Mm. Some, some, some happen pretty quickly. Some take a long time. Um, the artist is M. Wayne Miller. And he really, he really got it. Um, I'm looking online at the illustration he did for uh, Jeffrey, and Jeffrey says exactly what I said to him. Knocked it out of the park. I mean, he, he hit, put Jeffrey's vision straight on too. So, so I guess mine will be up online. The one for my story will be up online too. But yeah, it comes out of that same journals as that poetry book. What do you think were some of the lessons you learned about both publishing and writing in those early days of writing the Sheep Herders Journal? As far as publishing, don't ask your dad to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> my, dad, my dad did desktop <laughs> publishing too. I, learned, I, learned, well, I don't know if I learned that much from him, but I, after he passed away, I inherited his, his computer and his uh, printer, uh, which, helped, which gave me a boost. But uh, he, he worked with, a lot, with a, a lot of printers in New Jersey, so I asked him to, do, to like, lay it out and publish it and... He did, and he took it, but he, he like wanted, if you ever see this thing, I, some of the poets that were big influences on me, like Charles Olson or uh, William Cross Williams, Joanne Kiger, Mary Baraka, you know, write poetry that they don't line up, it doesn't, it doesn't left justify, you know, it's kind of spread around the page, and there's lots of reasons mm-hmm. for that, and I worked very heavily in that mode at that time, so that book is, is very much like that. I mean, I wrote in the journal like that. 
and because that's how I was thinking. And my dad wanted to you know, make it all love justified. I'm like, no. we got this huge argument. And anyway, you know, so I was living in America. I came home for Christmas, you know, and I, I gave him the stuff and the file. And he, he said he'd get it printed for me. And he got it printed. And I had this vision. The cover of the book was this picture of a butterfly. Uh, it's a this particular butterfly, I think, called Wiedermeyer's Admiral that I had seen on the mountain. And I had scanned, like, a picture of it out of an old field guide that I had when I was a kid. And it kind of zoomed in on just a portion of it. And it, I really liked the way it came out. It was just something I, di I did at work. And we've got the very first scanner we ever had over there. And I, for some reason, I had this, <coughs> had the book with me because I was trying to remember what butterfly I'd seen on the mountain. And I, so I scanned this picture. And it, I just liked the, it had this really rich quality to this, the scan when I blew it up. It was just an odd coincidence, a fortunate accident, you know, that happens so much in the creative process. So I, I later used that as the cover of the book and is the image I had on hand. And of course it fit the narrative. It's mentioned in the narrative or in, in the poems. And I, and I wanted always, it, like I wanted it to be kind of a rich chocolate brown, the, the printing on sort of a, maybe a, sort of a khaki background. I and mean, it had this very clear image of how I wanted it to be. So I get it back from my dad and, and, the, and the ink is mint green. Like bright, this lurid mint green. <laughs> I think you made like 25 copies. So anybody ever finds a, a green copy of that book, you have a real rarity. I think I gave, I had a couple left. I think I gave the last one I had to Laird Barron who, and thanking him for uh, all the help he gave me early on. So that's a real rarity. So there you go. If anyone has a copy, then please email in your photos. <laughs> now email me the book so I can sign it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It. I can s sell, I mean sign. <laughs> There's something with it. <laughs> John, I, I won't mention the the writer. who was a writer from the UK. is deceased now. But John Palin, you know, friend and mentor of mine, you know, a great huge book collector too. Uh, he, he's a couple times tipped me off when there's a signed copy of this author. There, he published with Arkham House a lot. Uh, when signed copies of his book show up online, and I have a couple of very nice ones, and or his books, he has several. Apparently, what would this guy would do? People would say, "Hey, can I you know, send you a copy of this book?" And this is the old days when you, you had to you know write them a letter too, not the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And they'd say, "Can I send you you know this book?" And you sign it, and I'll send you postage, send it back. And he would take the books and sell them and use them for beer money down the pub. So, like, very few people ever got their signed copies. <laughs> so they would mail him a book, and then he would sell the book that they mailed him. Yeah, he would sign it for someone else and sell it for more money, <laughs> and then. Wow. And then go drink down the, down the pub. Yeah, I won't, I won't say who that person was. He's deceased now, so we shall not speak ill of dead. But yeah, <laughs> I've got a couple of those. But I don't. Yeah. So yeah. So send me if you find that green copy of the Logan Chicken Mountain Journal. Send it to me. Yeah. So for the, include postage. <laughs> no, I've never. But done you got to you got to think. Uh, you got to call a guy who does that. I mean, it's not even evil. It's dastardly. That's it just. It's, like, it's awful. Yeah. Except it's a great. At the same time, it's a great anecdote, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> as long as it's not about me or you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then that guy was Bob. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. <laughs> I needed the now, money. <laughs> now people, people send me stuff to sign. I'll send it back with a jar of jam and salsa or something. So. I feel guilty paying postage even. Somebody actually bought my book. You know, Here, just, I'll, 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 I'll send it back. Priority. You know, throw, in, throw in four jars of homemade jam. Well, you don't get service like that from a lot of authors. <laughs> Probably <laughs> made <not>. jam. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I'm the only, I don't know any other author, authors who are making jam. So, <laughs> who else? We should start a, a club online. You know, a Facebook group for authors who make jam. Be me and maybe one other person. Most well, I mean, I wouldn't even do that because you could be the guy. You know, yeah, and that'd be, that's it. It's that's like, what's his name? The jam guy. guy. Shtick, yeah. The jam guy. Yeah, I, I you know, I probably already remembered his that. Oh, it's been quote. <laughs> the jam guy. Nobody yeah. remember my name. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, like, uh, I your war remembered for your jam. Man, that jam is good. But thirty man. years, thirty years from now, to some convention. What's that guy? He wasn't a very good writer. But he made good jam. What would they call him? The jam guy. <laughs> the jam guy. He had a beard. You know. Yeah. Well, if it really takes off, then you can add another little segment to the Outer Dark where you review jam. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like a two-minute segment. <laughs> I, I do have like a new little little short thing. It's, it's, it's top secret that's going to be when the Outer Dark comes. We've been a little bit of a hiatus, and we come back. I've got to, We're going to do something special. And, and only three people know about this. Is it about jam? 
No, it's not about Jan. <laughs> I kind of jam something in there, and it's yeah. Even, oh, just, oh, even Justin Steele doesn't know. It's kind of, Justin Steele probably never will know because he never listens to the damn show. So he has, he has no idea how it sounds after he records. <laughs> Oh, that's the first thing I did. I was like, oh, good. I have the recording of the show. I can listen to it now and see how stupid I sound before other people do. Yeah, I think that's why <laughs> Justin doesn't want to listen to <laughs> I do not like hearing my own voice. Uh, I mean, I like it through through my, you know, the way I hear it. But when mm -hmm. I hear it on a recording, I'm like, who's that doofus? Yeah, I'm used to it enough. I mean, remember the first time you ever heard your own voice recorded? I didn't think it was me. Yeah, I mean, when I was—I was thoroughly convinced that wasn't me. I said I said them words, but that wasn't me talking. When I was about oh, maybe like three or four, my dad bought a very early tape recorder. I don't know if he bought it or maybe we just went shopping and like looked at a shop. I remember like recording my voice or him recording my voice and playing it back, and yeah, freaked me out. And I think there's what's the scientific expl explanation for that? I mean, there's you're hearing also like through your your sinuses or something also, right? You're hearing through your inner ear and your outer ear or whatever. Exactly, your third eye and your pineal gland, and well, that's that's what it is. It's it's a it's acoustics is what it is. But I mean, the way you hear, you know, I've, I've I did a lot of studying in uh, sensation and perception, and one of the most fascinating things was uh, when I learned that if there's complete silence, your brain will make noise. Yeah, John to, Cage talked about that. He, he yeah, to keep the little sense. things inside your ears moving, they have to continuously move and that noise is typically a high pitch whine yep john cage talked about they put him in a the super soundproof room because yeah, he was obsessed with the ambient sounds and environmental mm -hmm. sound and, and they put him in this super soundproof room and he said even there there was no sounds there were two sounds you could hear his heart you could hear that high-pitched whine which was the brain the function of the brain right and it's like to me I, I, i've always been fascinated with that uh, that and the fact that people think that they have such a thing as an auditory subliminal message, which you can't have, uh, because of the way the ear operates. Yeah, I just, I just so, you know, I just pitched my three books there for people to buy. <laughs> there you go. That was a that was a subliminal message right there. <laughs> the high pitch one. I'm thinking that'd be that'd be a great story. Someone going crazy from their own high pitch one. You've heard of the Taos Hum, haven't you? What's that now? Have you ever heard of the Taos Hum? No. Taos, Taos, New Mexico, kind of arty place now. Or at least it was. Now it's more kind of touristy and arty. <clears throat> but uh, and of course, it's a very ancient pueblo there. It's still, you know, people still live there. The, the indigenous people. Uh, mm -hmm. So the town was built around the, the the Spanish settlement was built around the the pueblo, and the town was built around the settlement. And so there's sort of three cultures there still. Um, well, maybe four. There's the the, the Pueblo, there's the Spanish settlers, Mexican settlers, there's the the older people, there's the hippies that came, and then there's all the like the, the new 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 wave of Mexicans, I guess, which I maybe account as one, but I've been there for twenty six years. But I not in Taos anyway. So Taos is was famous for a long time for this thing called the Taos hum. A lot of people could hear this hum. And this is not the only place on earth this happens, but they could hear this strange, like, you know, very low hum. It, you know, it was written about. No one could ever prove it or test it or record it, as far as I know. And some time ago, I think back in the late 90s, it, it disappeared after, you know, decades or se a century or more. And it's funny because there was this other thing about Taos that was kind of a local joke. And way in the north side of town, there was a blinking light. The traffic light that was just a blinking light, you know. You, you, right. You just slow down or you stop. But it was it would never actually change like red, green. It, went through, it just blinked. And they, they got rid of that and made it a regular traffic light. I say that's, that's when the Taos hum stopped, when they got rid of the blinking light. It was the, it was the blinking light all along. Wow. Be I, I'd be shocked if, I don't know, I'd be shocked if it actually was the same time. That would be kind of weird. But both of those things, I think, disappeared. And one, one, you know, the one very obviously was just changed into, I mean, you know, mechanically changed into a regular traffic light. But the other, the infamous Taos hum, which was a New Mexico legend, you know, disappeared and, well, they 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 have these recordings. I've seen the videos, and I don't know exactly where they're at, but of this foghorn sounding tone. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's so eerie. I don't know what it is. It, yeah, that's it's, a, where's I forget where that is, but that's some other place. And there's some other place where they hear these weird booms all the time, right? Yeah, and yeah, it's like where are these sounds coming from. from? Lovecraft was talking about that in the Dumb Witch Horror too. In the beginning, that minister is talking about these sounds coming out of the earth. 
Right. And, you yeah, know, I so they, they've got like a ton of explanations. Teutonic plates, you know, and of course, meme, you know, the two, way I Teutonic think. plates or tectonic plates? <laughs> but those There's are two different plate. things. Some, some kind of like uh, Scandinavian death metal band down there. <laughs> <laughs> Tech. Tonic plates. <laughs> Too tight. I, I, like, I love that. Now I'm going to save this. <laughs> yes, that is a good thing. <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. It's good old Southeast Texas enunciation right there for you. What a two tonic plates. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, and I always come back to that. It, well, it, it's aliens, you know, <laughs> that's right, making well, the noise. You know, I don't know what it is, but it's aliens. Yeah, it's aliens. I don't know. It's it's aliens. <laughs> yeah, I tend to veer away from the alien explanation for stuff because if you ever if you ever done any archaeology in Easter Island, right? And mm -hmm. you, I don't even. It's not something I really advertise that much in in public conversation with outside of like archaeologists or maybe weird fiction circles, you know, because I've written about it. But people inevitably draws the crazies, and people come out. You know, they want to tell you about or ask you about aliens or Atlantis, and I'm like or Lemuria and all that bullshit, and I. Yeah. I no patience for that stuff because whenever people try to explain, you know, the pyramids or the Mayans or Easter Island or any of these other things with explanations like aliens or Atlantis, stuff like that, it's really, really racist. You know, they're saying, oh, these, these brown people couldn't have built this stuff, you know? And that's right. what Thor Heyerdahl was on about. You know, if you, if you read all of Thor Heyerdahl's crap, uh, and it's not all crap per se, there's there's meaningful stuff, and, and he, he did mount a, a really legitimate expedition to Easter Island in the 50s and put his own money out there. But he wrote this. His theory was that Easter Island in the Pacific was settled by from South America. Then he's doing these reed boat voyages from Egypt to South America. And then he was, you know, before he died, he was working on one from the Black Sea to Egypt. Because what he was really saying, if you read his stuff, he constantly goes back to mentioning these redheaded people. Supposedly there's redheaded people. You know, they find these redheaded skeletons or something. Right. You know, because the hair, you know, because they've been in this dried out hair that turned, you know, turned color in the grave, right? And right. he's, he's claiming, or they die, or they had some kind of die, or whatever. Who knows? You know, who knows what the reason is. But he's, he's, you know, trying to make this bullshit case that, you know, the people of Northern Europe were the high, bringers of high culture to the world. That's what The it's Vikings. Like. Yeah. And it's, it's, and I'll tell you, if, you know, for Easter Island, no, it's flat out bullshit. The, the, the Polynesians definitely made it to South America. There's no evidence that South Americans ever made it to Polynesia because nowhere in Polynesia is there pottery or textiles. And those are the two archaeological trademarks of pretty much all the high cultures of, of the Andes. There's absolutely no ceramics on Easter Island. They had clay, and their ancestors, the Lapita, early Polynesians, knew how to make pottery, but it died mm -hmm. out during the migrations. They had clay on the island, but they never made pottery. And there's no pottery you know, until, until Europeans come. So for that. So anyway, yeah, that, that whole Atlantis alien stuff, I hate that. And it's, you know, it's, it's always, there's always the implication that, you know, only white people can make this sort of stuff, you know? And there's, you know, people, traditional people had great engineering skills. And the Polynesians were the greatest navigators that ever lived until, you know, the invention of the compass. So anyway, I digress again, but there, there we have <laughs> So yeah, we could talk about aliens in terms of the X-Files and stuff like that. I mean, I, I believe there's, you know, life on other planets. I'm really fascinated by that, that weird star, you know, that star that keeps dimming, you know, incredibly, that they might... I think it has some kind of alien superstructure around it. I really hope that is. Well, I mean, we talk about it a lot at work because we get bored sometimes. And I, I try to tell, you know, the my coworkers, you know, they're like, do you, do you think that there's life on other planets? I said there has to be. But I think there's a reason why it's that we're never going to see it. Yeah, they've seen uh, our TV broadcasts. That's <laughs> it, it's, it's like you've got to have seen Full House. They're not coming here. It's it's basically to me it's like that's probably the last mystery, and it's going to remain a mystery. I don't know. I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if we find that any day, but I don't think they're they're hanging out here and just probing people's anuses or anything. No, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't believe in any of that. I, I think that stuff's just rather humorous to tell you the truth. I mean, in New Mexico, like a, we get we get flooded with that stuff all the time. There's a town called Dulce. It's on the Hickory Her Apache Reservation, which is. Mm -hmm. Uh, 60 miles, 60, 90 miles east of where I live. It's on the way to Taos. And I have, I have some friends out there. And there's a, there's a big mesa that starts there and runs over the border into Colorado. It's called Archuleta Mesa. And the UFO conspiracy theories, it, it, and you, can, you Google this, you'll see a ton of stuff. In the, in the UFO conspiracy theories, they believe that after the Roswell 
crash and the Aztec, you know, supposed Aztec UFO crash right after that, which is Aztec is very close to where I live. Mm -hmm. um, after the supposed you know UFO crashes that the government made a tre treaty with the aliens. I interviewed this guy that was head of a local UFO group who told me all this stuff, and, I, and I've seen it you know time and again online. They made a treaty with the aliens, and the aliens gave us Velcro, <laughs> which has obvious space uses, right? They gave right. us Velcro and some other technologies like microchip or whatever, and in turn, we gave them a secret underground base on Archuleta Mesa. So Archuleta Mesa in Dulce, New Mexico, according to the UFO nuts, is where all these you know flying saucers are coming out of. And I have I have friends out there, you know, former students, and they tell me stories like you know some hippies come out there and they say, "Take me to the UFO crash site," which is not on Archuleta Mesa. But that's in Aztec or Roswell, which is way down south. And Roswell is almost in Texas. You know, they'd, they'd come out there. Some of my, my friends would say, "Oh yeah, I'll take you." They'd give them like five hundred bucks, and they just walk them out to some random clearing in the woods and say, "Yeah, it's right here. It's where it happens. It's where it'll happen." So it's, it's like a cottage industry for those folks out there. You know. White, white people show up in town, like weird-looking white people, and they, you know, they know right away they're going to make some money dra dragging around and snipe on in the woods. I love that. They deserve it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's mean, but, I mean, come on. And people, and people will tell all kinds of stories. <laughs> people will tell all kinds of stories about, like, hiking up there and, like, kicking over a rock and there was an air vent under it, you know, and stuff like that. It's all bullshit. You know, they say there's a lot of, although the, my Apache friends up there, if you ask them, they say there are funny things going on up there, and they never quite talk about it. Although, to well, be sure, there, there are two clans. The Hickory Apaches have two clans, and all the stories I've heard have been from one clan. The other clan claims there's nothing. So it's very interesting. But that's, that's another decoration. I don't think there's aliens hanging around here. I don't, I reason, personally, I think the reason we don't find them, we're not getting radio broadcasts from other stars, is because... You know, how long have we been using radio, right? Barely 100 right. years. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's a technology that within 100 years we won't be using anymore. We'll be using, you know, some kind of other method of communication for that sort of thing. Gravity waves. Right. And I'm, I'm not saying that we won't ever communicate with them. I think that we'll discover that they're so far away. People do not understand the vastness of the universe and how yeah. we're yeah. we're in a galaxy and the next galaxy, even if we could send someone out there, we'd have to send like their whole family. It'd be a generation of people that would eventually get to that destination. Hey, the, next, the next star. Yeah. To get to the next star. Although now they've got this thing where they think you can send like a mic, you know, a tiny probe out there within a generation. Well, Who knows? I've read a lot I of mean, science fiction. A lot of I read a lot of that. You know, I, I read. When I can cutting edge science too, I try to keep up with it. Not as much as I used to, and there there are some potentials. I mean, we have nothing now. We have no. We have nothing now that could you know reach so you know sub light speeds. And until we do, it's not going to happen. Exactly. Uh, that that one. I mean, I'm just that one star. It's got a number designation you know, where they found it dims like twenty to seventy percent, and they think it might be because some sort of alien superstructure is passing in front of it. And it's a legitimate explanation. Something weird is going on. So I suppose supposedly they're tuning a lot of the radio telescopes to it now, and I'm, we haven't heard anything back. I'd like to, you know, it's one of the more promising leads that's been found out there. But I doubt, it, you know, any advanced civilization is probably still using radio. You read Ian M. Banks, right, in, in, in his books, you know, these really advanced civilizations, they, they sublime, you know, they, they abandon any kind of material form, and they probably, that's probably what would happen. Or maybe their robots killed them all, or, or they had nuclear wars, you know. <laughs> I said recently online, I, I think, you know, things happen for a reason, and I think the reason the human race happened is so it can destroy itself and exist as a cautionary tale for, for aliens or for, or for whatever evolves next on this planet. I don't think we're it. I don't, we're I just don't a fable. It. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think we're the end game for intelligent life on this planet. I think, we're, I think we're a failed experiment like the dinosaurs. I think we're already failed. Hey, but in the meantime, though, we just got to have a good time and yeah. love one another. That's, I mean, that's it. You got to... Show compassion for other people because that's all we have. Yeah, that's all we've got. Well, switching gears somewhat <laughs> away yeah, from uh, there. Uh, away from humans as a failed life form, <laughs> <laughs> which which you know, I mean, the the idea that we are as intelligent as it gets, I mean that that's pretty depressing. But no, I doubt that. I don't think we're near as intelligent. I mean, I think we're near the bottom. I don't want to take the podcast in too nihilistic a direction. <laughs> well, so, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not like Ligotti. I'm not an anti-natalist. 
I, I don't. I think we got to keep trying, and we got to try to do better. But I, I, mm. I look in my country, and I look at some of the other countries around the world. I mean, in the UK, pretty much everywhere, but Canada. I mean, Canada's got its problems too. But at least they've got Trudeau for the time being. But you know, I look at people like Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, and I think, you know, there's there's the end of the world right there waiting to happen. Yeah. Scary. Difficult to argue with. <sighs> it's a scary time. However. Changing the yeah, direction of the yeah, interview yeah. completely, we have a question from Jake Marley from our Patreon. Oh, okay. And so you've written quite a few novellas, and Jake wants to know if when you sit down to write a story, if you have a certain length in mind, or if the stories that you're writing define themselves and the scope and nature of the story? And the answer is yes. <laughs> it really okay. is. But there there you great... go, Jake. <laughs> yeah. now, Jake Jake's, this, Jake's got a great question. and you know, I know him online. He's a great guy. It's a really good question because I, I often do or usually do sit down with a particular length in mind and I blow it widely. I think when I sat down, let's see, what was one of the longest stories I've written? Um, Maybe um, fra okay, Frag Me Taste, which is in the in on the Kaitangata, my first collection. That story is at least twenty thousand words, I think, maybe longer. When I started that, when I thought, all right, this one is, I finally got an idea. You know, it's going to be a four or five thousand word story, and I can sell it. <laughs> <laughs> twenty thousand words, you know, fifteen thousand words later, you know, whatever. No, so I thought, yeah, I thought that was going to be a short story, and it became a novella. Other times, there's a story I just I'm kind of I just did some finishing touches on last night, and it's I think a little over seven thousand words which for me is short, right? And it's not even a novelette, and I thought that was going to be a twenty thousand word novella. So I, I am horribly, miserably awful at predicting the length of my stories. Which the second part of Jake's question is, yeah, I let the stories evolve, and you know they do what they want to do. They do. I, and I, I there's a there's a there's a give and take between the author and the story, at least in my case, where you know there's there's some attempt to corral it within bounds and and, and to know what's part of the story and what's not. Uh, at the same time, you got to let what the story you, you got to give it its head, so to speak. You know, you keep it with a horse and let it go. But you know, at the same time, you've got the reins and you've got to you've got to get where you've got to get to the end point eventually. But it may not take the route you planned. I was on a panel about novellas with Jack Ketchum and some other folks uh, about a year ago at the World Horror Convention, and pretty much everybody you know that's writing a lot of novellas said the same thing. You know, it's a very organic form, more so than the short story or the novel in some ways, which have you know kind of a more set length and and, and, a, and a more set structure. I mean, the the, the short story is, is almost a set a structure. You know, the four or five thousand words short story is almost as set a structure as haiku in its way. You know, it has very specific things that it does, even though there's an incredible, infinite range of possibilities you can do with that. The novella is a very organic form. Well, I was going to say you spoke about deviating from the route that you take from your plan. So how much planning is going into that when you write your initial draft? Well, it's not, it's not, not necessarily, I guess maybe if I say it's like, you know, taking a different route, it's not necessarily... It's not necessarily the stories go in different directions. It's maybe the way, it's maybe there's more, it's maybe there's more to see along the road than you realize when you start out with it. Um, and partly because when I started writing again in the late part of the last decade, because I said I wrote some stories in the, I wrote some stories in the 80s, you know, I wrote some stories in the 90s, and then I really got serious it, it, towards the end of the last decade, around 2008, 2009, 10 maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's when I wrote the stories that, that I've been publishing and that, you know, that many of them are in Anakai Tangata. And there's a few that, that I wrote before that that, I haven't been, that I didn't collect and don't plan to collect, although I still think they're good stories. They just didn't fit with those stories. I began, especially with the, with the title story of Anakai Tangata, I began taking an approach unconsciously at first. And then as that story grew and then as I wrote other stories later, it became conscious eventually, and then you know I've been doing other things unconsciously. I guess that you know you, you start with things you're doing them without realizing it, and then you just you, in, at some level, 
a similar level of consciousness, and sometimes that this happens unconsciously too in the creative process. You either reject those processes or things that are happening, or you embrace them and increase and enhance them. Does that make sense? You guys, you know, mm. that, you know I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. So I realized at some point I was always interested in storytelling. I was interested in atmosphere, and that goes way back to my early exposure to the Dunwich Horror, which is really a story all about atmosphere, right? If you think of it, Lovecraft starts the story with with break. He breaks all the rules instead of going right into the action, giving you that hook, you know, the first paragraph that you think you're supposed to do, like people tell people that's what you got to do. Bullshit. He says, oh, sometimes, you know, you take the wrong turn on this road, you know, on the Aylesbury Pike, and you go through here, and the frogs are too loud, and the, everything is real creepy, and there's weird hills and stuff like that. And then you get back on the main road, and it's only, you only then, like a page later, then do you find out about Dunwich. Oh, and let me tell you about this weird old minister who used to be in Dunwich. He used to say this, that, and then he disappeared, and then all this other stuff happened, and they got these old dissolved families out there that are really fucked up, and, oh, yeah, and okay, let's finally start the story three pages later, right? Three pages, like but three he, or four pages of a building atmosphere only. That's setting the hook. Yeah. Which and, is, and is he, powerful he, when done right. Yeah, and he did it. I mean, that's, that's an, you know, I think S.T. Joshi hates that story, and he hates it because it's a story that talks about the soul, right? Lovecraft doesn't, you know, he talks about the, never talks about the soul. But it's a, it's a technically, there's some amazing things he does in this story, amazing things. And, and they still stand up really, really well. But he, 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 he ripped that off whole from Algernon Blackwood's The Willows, which does the same exact thing at the beginning. Exactly. Although he, it, does, it goes in a different direction. And Lovecraft repeats that in a, sh- in a shorter form at the beginning of The Color Out of Space, too. It's set in the same part of Massachusetts. Which, incidentally, is where like the uncle that I, who gave me a copy of The Dumbage Horror when I was in second grade lived in that part of Massachusetts. Which I didn't realize until a few years, years ago. Which is pretty weird. And when I dream about visiting his old house, it's, it's the Waitley Mansion. And it's been that way for years. I have dreams of mm. going, but yeah, I I, I became I was, I always thought atmosphere even before I realized what it, what it was called was a key element. It was I was fascinated by it, and of course the Dunwich Horror is a story that's just dripping with atmosphere, right? Literally, you know, it's just a, it's a miasma of the whole story. And when I started writing again really seriously in, in the late two thousands, uh, the first decade two thousands, I, I that was interest very early on. And in the Easter Island story, I just went all out with it. And eventually, what I realized. And in and, and the first few stories I wrote, I felt like the characterization was not what I wanted. And I look back, and it's pretty good, actually, relatively, anyway. I'm not, dis- I'm not unhappy with it anymore. But I felt like I wanted more character. I wanted to know more about the characters. So I, I began to, to really emphasize atmosphere and characterization constantly, consciously. And what I realized at some point was that I was using atmosphere and character to drive the narrative. And you can do that. They're not window dressing. You can drive the narrative. The narrative evolves out of who your people are and where they are. That's what creates the story in a lot of cases. So plot, I mean, really, if you think about it, plot is an artifice. Plot is this artificial structure that we impose on reality. You know, it's a, we impose narratives on our life, all, on our own lives all the time, you know, not just on fiction. But character and atmosphere are organic. I mean, they, they, they grow. They, they take shapes that we can't control. So I think that's probably a lot of reasons why, you know, in order to develop those things at length, you generally have to go 8, 9, 10, 15, 20,000 words. So some of that happens. But I, 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 it's not to say that I don't have plot. I mean, plot grows out of the narrative or out of, out of the atmosphere and the characterization rather than driving it, I think, to a large extent in my stories. Although there are times where I have the plot mapped out completely before I start. Like um, the longest thing I've written... Tuckahoe, there's like 42,000 words. That I knew the plot of fairly before I wrote it. Although there's some, some key elements. That I didn't, I, the, ending, the ending kept getting worse and worse for the character. I kept, <laughs> it's like one of those heavy metal songs, all the fake endings or whatever. And I just, I, I said, oh, wait, I can, I can fuck him up even more by the end. <laughs> so, I, so I, you know, I, I, I added a few more twists there at the end and a few more things happen. And, and actually there's a scene with a train and that my discussion about the train uh, was the inspiration for the story to Nebrio on the day that I wrote with my son. Uh, so so the, uh, working on train, mentioning trains at the end of that story leapt into this other story. But it, it's, I, I don't do a lot of outlining. You know, I, I, a while back I stayed at another writer friend's house and I stayed in, I guess it was a study. I don't, I don't say he's a great, great writer. 
a really excellent writer, but I, I don't want to. I don't want it. It sounds the contrast might in terms of what I'm talking about for myself might make it sound like I'm being critical, but I'm not. But this this writer had. I, I was sitting. I was actually recorded a podcast sitting at his desk, and he had these like sheets like on a clipboard of like this like where he thought all these things about a story when he was planning it, and he had this bulletin board with a post-it notes so, like, mapping out all these details of the story. I'm like, what the hell? How, how can you do that? I don't have time for that bullshit. I just sit down and write, you know? So I don't know. I mean, there's diff everybody has their own way that works for them. I mean, that guy, his stuff is very organic, too. I would, never, I would never have guessed he was doing all this planning. I mean, I feel like it reads a lot like mine. It has some qualities that I like in mine. So I think as long as same. you don't make it like a crutch to where... Yeah. Or, or that's all you spend your time doing. I'm planning. I've got 20 novels planned. Yeah, I'll no, write them one yeah. day, but I'm still tweaking my plan. No, you need that's to actually what, write. That's what I did for a long time. I mean, I, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, I spent a lot of time planning stuff I never wrote. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. That was episode 90 with Scott Nicolay. Remember, if you'd like to support the podcast, then you can pledge just $1 to our Patreon. And when doing so, you get a number of perks, including early bird access to all of our episodes, ebooks, discounts off This Is Horror products, and very, very soon, designed by the wonderful Pi Par, This Is Horror t shirts. Another way in which you can support the show that will cost you absolutely no money, is to leave us a review over on iTunes. Or simply, if there's an episode you've enjoyed, share it with a friend, whether on social media, or email, or even a, a recommendation in person. An incredible thing to contemplate, I know, in this digital age, but it can happen. All right. Well, with that said, thank you again for listening. Take care of yourselves, look after one another, and as always, have a great day.